We call an economy capitalist when capitalism is dominant. So the proper term would be capitalism is a, is a hybrid that contains capitalist, socialist, and statist forms of power relations within which the capitalist form of power relations is the dominant one and subordinates the other two. But we will just call it capitalist for short. So here we are. It's 8 o'clock. Uh, um, <laughs> that was a little longer than the half hour, not that much longer. I guess I started about 20 minutes. So I think I'll just go with the flow here <clears throat> and tell you about uh, real utopias in and beyond capitalism. So the protests we just watched, uh, while distinctive in many ways, are nevertheless familiar. I imagine most of you have been involved uh, in political protest, demonstrations of various sorts. Uh, after all, very few people would come to a lecture of this sort who weren't in one way or another politically active, and part of the menu of being politically active in our societies is being involved in protests and demonstrations. And this one in Wisconsin was quite extraordinary, rather unprecedented. Certainly the occupation of the state capitol building was unprecedented. Uh, but there's always a problem with political protests, I think, in that they are much clearer about what they're against than what they're for. Typically, protests and demonstrations are directed in opposition to some dominant power, some policies that people are object to, as in the case of Wisconsin, <coughs> um, and much vaguer often about the vision of alternative which they represent. Uh, this issue of the vision of alternative, I think, has become more pressing over time. There was a time when I was a student protester, where we thought we knew what the vision of alternative was. We had a name for it, socialism. And we were all pretty confident that we knew enough about what we were talking about to get on with the business of struggle in various ways. Uh, of course, there were debates about what really was socialism. Those debates have always been present. But there wasn't deep uncertainty about the possibility of an alternative. Well, we know from the last three decades of um, the common history of places as different as Germany and the United States, that the notion that there is no alternative, that's a phrase Margaret Thatcher coined, Tina, it's referred to in English, there is no alternative. That idea has gained a lot of traction. And with the end of the um, command economies, the idea that there is no alternative began to gain some attra attraction even in people who were sharply critical of capitalism. I mean, after all, in the old days when there was the Soviet Union and the GDR with their authoritarian and bureaucratic command economies, it was possible to say, yes, there is an alternative to capitalism, and we don't like that alternative because it's authoritarian and bureaucratic. What's needed is a radical democratization of that alternative. But there wasn't doubt about the possibility of alternative. The, the possibility of alternative was there on the ground. What was needed was a transformation of the alternative into a form that people could embrace. Well, the demise of those systems, initially, many people, myself included, thought this was an emancipation of our imagination. We no longer were saddled with the specter of that kind of system. We could now talk about democratic socialism without having to go through a big song and dance about why it wasn't what you see in the Soviet Union. Uh, it turned out that that is not how the ideolog ideological battles played themselves out. What occurred was a real loss of confidence, I think, pretty broadly felt, even by people who remain absolutely steadfast in their critique of capitalism. Uh, that was the context in which I started what I call the Real Utopias Project, as a way of rethinking the problem of alternatives um, in a way that um, was as expansive as possible, not seeing this as a narrow effort at simply rehabilitating older ideas, treating it as a freewheeling, open-ended project of exploring alternatives to capitalist society that were utopian in the sense that they were alternatives that embodied our deepest aspirations for a just and humane world, but were real in the sense 
of looking for alternatives to dominant institutions that are attentive to problems of unintended consequences, self-destructive dynamics, and the dilemmas of normative trade-offs. What I want is a utopian vision that is fully utopian in the sense of not compromising on the values and not feeling shy about those values and above all, not being cynical about the values, to really hold on to the aspiration for a world of universalized human flourishing, to hold on to that aspiration and still be attentive to the requirements and conditions for real institutions to accomplish our goals. Now that's an impossible combination in a sense and it's that impossibility that I try to embrace and carry through in a program of research that is both empirical, studying instances of prefigurative real utopias in the world and theoretical, trying to think through the logic of alternatives, uh, specify their conceptual structure. The background assumption of the real utopias uh, is what I would call a foundational empirical claim which I consider non-controversial. I consider this an absolutely well-established empirical claim about the world. Of course, it's very controversial to many people, but I feel of the various things which I believe to be empirically true, I put this at the high le confidence level, you know, of my, on the spectrum of things that I hold. Uh, and here's the foundational empirical claim. Many forms of human suffering and many deficits in human flourishing are the result of capitalism. Simple, straightforward, empirical claim. Transcending capitalism has the potential, and the word potential is important here, uh, to reduce human suffering and expand the possibilities for human flourishing. That's the background set of claims, which then animates the search for alternatives. Uh, well, here's a list of examples that I study. Uh, and there are many more I could give. Now, if we hadn't um, had our little detour through the protests of Wisconsin, what I would do is spend some time talking about each of these. These examples all constitute, well, all but the last one at least, all constitute empirical cases, things we can study, that I think embody anti-capitalist principles. They're real, they exist in the world, they prefigure alternatives. And in studying them, we can ask questions such as, under what conditions could they be enlarged? Can they be replicated? Can they be scaled up? What are the principles that enable them to work well or badly? And how can they be copied and modified to serve broader emancipatory purposes? Uh, what I'll do is just quickly run down this list and for a couple of them, make some comments. But I would like to not spend too much time on the examples and rather focus more on the theoretical framework I use to interpret these examples, okay? Urban participatory budgets. This, I think, is familiar to many of you, perhaps all of you. Uh, it started in Porto Alegre. It's a way of reorganizing the way cities produce public infrastructure. Now, that's the way I would describe it. It's reorganization of the way cities produce infrastructure, which turns out to be a reorganization of the way cities organize their budgets. But what's really happening is ordinary citizens are directly involved in making the choices about what kind of infrastructure the cities should produce. That's what the full-blown full participatory budgets do. Solidarity finance, it's an interesting innovation in Quebec in which unions use part of their pension funds not to buy stocks or bonds in ordinary investment markets, but rather to use parts of their investment funds as what is called private equity investment, to directly invest in small and medium firms in exchange for the union being represented on the board of directors in one way or another, and the firm signing on to a set of labor charters and environmental charters. It's a way for unions to get into a position of greater direct control over the use of collective forms of capital. Um, the Quebec social economy is a wide, I'm, I'm doing what I said I didn't have time to do, right? I'm telling you a little bit about each. Uh, 
So I, I, I've got to, I've got to resist. Let me just say a couple of, about a couple of them. Okay, public libraries I like because normally people don't think of public libraries as, uh, as a kind of anti-capitalist institution, right? And indeed, the American public library system, which is one of the best in the world, it's really fantastic. The I think the public library system in the U.S. was originally founded by Andrew Carnegie, who paid for cities, he gave fantastic amounts of money to small cities all over the country, towns, uh, to build libraries. I grew up in Lawrence, Kansas, and we had a Carnegie Library, paid for by Andrew Carnegie, who felt his children shouldn't inherit anything because uh, it was um, a violation of a equal opportunity for them to inherit from him, so he spent down his fortune. Uh, public libraries distribute books on the principle to each according to need. They uh, monitor the uh, demand for books by waiting lists. It's rationed by time. And more books are ordered for libraries in order to keep the waiting list down to a specified length. Public libraries that are deeply embedded in democratic processes in local communities provide public space for meetings. They provide all sorts of uh, public commons for social activities. Uh, and become a collective resource for democratic and egalitarian participation. The best of public libraries are like that. In some countries, public libraries are designed to protect books from people. Uh, <laughs> and those would not be an example of a real utopian public library. But uh, public libraries at their best, I think, are. Uh, Wikipedia is another one of my favorite examples of a real utopia. It not only distributes information freely to every person. It produces information in the form of encyclopedias through the voluntary, free, unpaid cooperation of hundreds of thousands of editors around the world, and has done so so effectively that it's, a, it's basically destroyed a capitalist market that's been around since the 18th century. The capitalist market for general purpose encyclopedias is dead. Nobody could sell such an encyclopedia. I mean, there may be some people who like the ornamentation of having it on their bookshelves, but but for informational purposes, a voluntary process. I mean, just think about it. Go back to 2000, the year 2000 and ask, what do you think? Here's a proposal. Let's get together and create an encyclopedia with four million entries in English. Uh, we won't pay anybody to write the entries, and anybody can have it for free. And anybody can edit anybody else's entries. How about that? Do you think we can do it? And let's, um, let's get this done so that within 10 years, we have four million entries. You know, people think you're crazy. It's impossible. <laughs> It certainly violates all the incentive principles of rational economic actors. Uh, it's uh, produced on the basis of to each according to need, from each according to ability. Uh, we seem to have heard that before. It's a deeply anti-capitalist principle. I gave a lecture two weeks ago at the Wikimedia Foundation, which is the um, organization in San Francisco that runs all the infrastructure for Wikipedia. Uh, I was at the Wikimedia Foundation because as president of the American Sociological Association, I have a Wikipedia initiative that the ASA will do, which I could tell you about later. I won't go into that now. So I gave this talk, and I said to the, and I, with some trepidation, so I'm an experienced lecturer, right? I've been around for a long time. I don't normally get at all intimidated when I give talks, no anxiety, but when I was giving a talk on Wikipedia at the Wikimedia Foundation, I thought, are they going to think I'm just foolish? Uh, do I have this completely wrong? So I, I was, had some trepidation as to how it would be received. And I asked them, OK, what is Wikipedia an example of? What do you think it's an example of? And I said, uh, you ask a, a teenager on the street, and they'll say it's an example of a cool thing on the web. You know, Google, Facebook, Twitter, and Wikipedia. If you ask a sophisticated economist, sociologist, um, programmer, they'll say, oh, no, no, it's an example of open source collaborative peer-to-peer -peer production. And they would group it with Linux and Apache and things like that. And I said, no, there's something much deeper that Wikipedia is a member of a family. And it would include solidarity finance, urban participatory budgets, the Mondragon Worker Cooperative, uh, and many other things. Now, they loved it. They thought that was fantastic. I mean, I've never given a talk where people got so energized by an idea that they hadn't thought of, because that is not how they saw what they were doing. They were geeks. 
They were enthusiastic geeks, uh, committed to open source, but in this kind of anarchistic way. They didn't see it as part of a transformative project that had implications way beyond the provision of an information system globally in the way that they were doing. Uh, and that's how, indeed, I think Wikipedia should be located. Okay, I'll leave the rest of my list. What I want to do now is give you a framework. Okay, so this is a list of interesting things. We have a problem. We identify the foundational empirical claim, capitalism causes human suffering. Poverty in the midst of plenty is a consequence of the way our institutions are organized, not a law of nature. And the diagnosis of what it is about our institutions that produce poverty in the mix of plenty is the first approximation, capitalism. Now, that's a simple formulation. Of course, I don't believe that capitalism and only capitalism is the cause of poverty in the midst of plenty. I'm not proposing that simple a reductionist view. But I do think it's at the foundation of the problem. Poverty in the midst of plenty, capitalism is the diagnosis. And then the question is how to think about alternatives. I've given a list of examples of real utopias, things that I think do violate capitalism and do offer the prospects of emancipatory alternatives. Now what I want to do is propose a framework in which we can locate these and many other kinds of examples. And I refer to this framework as taking the social in socialism seriously. The word social appears in socialism. It appears in social democracy. But in socialism, the word social often does very little theoretical work. It's there, but it's not actually doing a whole lot of work. It's a, it's a placeholder for a concept. And the question is, how can we give it content? All right, so I'm going to give you a vocabulary. Um, and you'll have to just be, bear with me. This is the part of this presentation that, you know, my students sometimes complain that some of my lectures are like dictionaries, because I spend a lot of time defining concepts and making distinctions. Some people find that illuminating, other people find it just excruciating. I hope, I hope the ratio of illumination and excruciation here is on the illumination side. Uh, I build my model, my theoretical construct here, around three kinds of power. Power is the capacity to do things in the world, to produce effects. That's a generic, open-ended concept of power. It's not some fancy, esoteric, social theory concept of power. The ordinary notion, you have power, it gives you a capacity to do things. Different kinds of power are based on different kinds of capacities. And I distinguish three forms of power in this analysis. Economic power is power based on the control over economic resources. State power is power based on the control of rule making and rule enforcing over territory. And social power, what I'm calling social power, is power based on the capacity to mobilize voluntary cooperation and collective action. So if you want a bumper sticker you know, to put on your car that, that identifies these three forms of power, you can say there are three ways to get people to do things. You can bribe them, you can force them, or you can persuade them. Uh, persuasion is a form of power because it enables collective action to take place, which could not take place without the persuasion, and which enables you to accomplish things in the world. So I think of social power as real power, even if it's the most fragile of the three. Three forms of power. Now, I use these three forms of power to differentiate three kinds of economic structures, which have, fam uh, have somewhat familiar names. At least two of them do. I'm going to use this notion of power to differentiate capitalism, socialism, and what I am going to call statism. So capitalism is an economic structure within which economic activity, investment, production, and distribution, is controlled through the exercise of economic power. What I'm calling statism is an economic structure within which economic activity is controlled through the exercise of state power. What I'm calling statism was once called, at least in some quarters, socialism, that is the Command economies of the East were a form of what I would call statism. They were economic structures within which economic activity, investment, production, and distribution was controlled through the exercise of state power. And social 
socialism, a social socialism, is an economic structure within which economic activity is controlled through the exercise of social power. That is power based on the capacity to mobilize voluntary cooperation and collective action. Socialism is an economic structure in which economic activity is controlled and regulated and organized through the exercise of social power. Now this is equivalent to saying socialism is an economic structure within which economic activity is democratically controlled. Those are equivalent statements because democracy is precisely the subordination of other forms of power to social power. When we, in the ordinary use of language, talk about the state being democratic, what do we mean? We don't mean that state power disappears. And we don't mean that each and every person in the society as a separate person controls the state. No, what we mean is the people in the society, through their voluntary cooperation and association, and through particular institutions which render this possible, subordinate the state. Those institutions include elections. And the associations include political parties. Political parties are voluntary associations by which people come together to control state power through the mechanism of elections. And so we can say that in a democratic society, state power is subordinated to social power. In a democratic socialism, then, state power is subordinated to social power and economic power is subordinated to social power. Uh, we need one more concept to give you my full menu here, and that's the notion of hybrid. All real economic systems are complex combinations of capitalism, statism, and socialism. We call an economy capitalist when capitalism is dominant. So the proper term would be capitalism is a, is a hybrid that contains capitalist, socialist, and statist forms of power relations within which the capitalist form of power relations is the dominant one and subordinates the other two. But we will just call it capitalist for short. The possibility of socialism then revolves around the problem of enlarging and deepening the socialist component of the hybrid and weakening the capitalist component. Weakening the capitalist component of this mixed hybrid and strengthening the socialist component. And I refer to this as the problem of building configurations of social empowerment. Uh, now I'll give you a visual vocabulary. I represent these, this problem of configurations of social empowerment in a visual format. And let me tell you how to read the diagrams. Uh, the three types of power appear in ovals. Um, that's for no reason whatsoever, the shape. I, was, I mentioned this this afternoon. I was once asked in a serious way why they were ovals and not circles. And it's a perhaps profound question, but I have no answer. Uh, <clears throat> the arrows reflect, represent directions of interaction of power constraints. I'll explain what that means a little bit more in a moment. And the strength and autonomy of power is represented by the thickness of the arrows. We can distinguish in the first approximation primary and secondary forms of constraint. So let me just illustrate this quickly. I've already mentioned conventional democracy. Conventional democracy is social power dominates state power. That's what conventional democracy means. Corporate control of political parties, as in the United States, where the nature of the funding mechanisms for parties enables large and wealthy corporations and individuals to effectively dominate political parties, both Democrats and Republicans. Uh, this is a case of economic power dominating social power in this particular form, that is, the social power represented by political parties. You can then string these relationships together and say that corporate control of state power via the funding of political parties is, has this double relationship. Social power of political parties is subordinated to corporate power and state power is still regulated by competitive elections among political parties. But because of that intermediate step, uh, economic power is translated into state power. 
uh, social control of economic power via state regulation of capital, the ideal of a social democracy, would be represented by social power subordinating state power and state power regulating economic power. I then use that visual vocabulary to examine the relationship of all three forms of power to this particular problem, economic activity. Uh, by which I mean investment, production, and distribution of goods and services. So it's all the activities that we associate with the economy. And uh, the argument then is that economic activity is regulated through the exercise of power, but not just sort of random power, power articulated, structured in particular configurations. This is how we would describe the overall configurations of capitalist empowerment. That is, the primary forms of power relations come from economic power. Economic power directly controlling investment production and distribution is the direct exercise of capitalist power over the economy. And the indirect forms occur through the way capitalist power shapes state power and the way capitalist power shapes social power. Social empowerment, in contrast, has the central primary forms of power emanating from social power. Social power affecting state power in this way is, as I said, the conventional notion of democracy, subordinating the state to social power. And in this direction, social power shaping economic power is the subordination of economic power to social power or democratic control directly over the exercise of economic power. And the direct effect of social power on economic activity is the direct way in which voluntary cooperation of people shapes the forms of investment, production, and distribution in a socially empowered socialism. Our task then is to explore two central problems. These are the two basic problems of an emancipatory project of social transformation. The institutional designs that reduce capitalist empowerment and increase social empowerment. That is, institutional designs that weaken these relations and strengthen these. It's two parallel, complementary tasks. Weaken these and strengthen these. And secondly, strategies of transformation. How do you do it? The designs tells you what you want to do. The strategies of transformation tells you perhaps, if you're lucky, how to do it. Um, now, I have elaborated in the book seven configurations of social empowerment. That is, I as look through the various examples that I've listed above, that I listed earlier, plus many others, have parsed the total set of examples into seven different configurations that constitute configurations in which social power can uh, <clears throat> become the dominant form of power. And then the overall political project is how do we actually create the institutions that would embody that. This is a pluralistic notion of social empowerment, not just one way. There's seven. Uh, there may be more. When I first started lecturing on this, as I was developing the arguments in the book, I had initially four and then five, and then through discussions with people, I realized that some of my categories combined more than one configuration, and it eventually elaborated into seven. Um, let me just quickly run through these uh, seven, just so you get a flavor for what I'm talking about. Okay, configurations of social empowerment. The first one I will call statist socialism. This is the conventional, standard, classical way, I think, that socialism was conceived. State power directly regulates economic activity, but state power is itself subordinated to society. That is, if you want to use the class language of classical Marxism, the working class controlled the state. If you want a more openly democratic language, the state is democratically controlled by the people. Uh, the subordination of the state to social power means that social power shapes economic activity via the mediation of the state. This is the vision that was uh, described, I think, even in Lenin's work prior to the revolution, State and Social Revolution, has this as its implicit vision. 
Uh, the aftermath of the revolutions, however, produced a different configuration, what I would call authoritarian statism, rather than statist socialism. In authoritarian statism, state power subordinates social power rather than the vice versa. Now that switch of arrow, I mean symbolically in the picture, the shift of arrow from this direction to this direction, is a profound transformation of the very nature of the structure. It's not a detail, it's the fundamental character of the power relations in the structure. And it's why I call the Soviet Union a form of authoritarian statism or a statist form of production rather than simply a distorted socialism. It's not a socialism, it's not a form of economic structure within which social power plays a predominant role. Uh, the second pathway is associated with social democracy. In a social democracy, economic power directly controls economic activity. Capitalist firms, in fact, do the investing, producing, and distributing. But the economic power is regulated by the state in various ways that is itself subordinated to social power. And so it's one of the ways that social power can be translated into effects and controls over economic activity via the way social power shapes the regulatory capacity of the state over economic power. It's complicated, it's a double mediation, but nevertheless it's one of the pathways. Uh, this pathway also can be destroyed and replaced by what could be called capitalist statist regulation, a much more common configuration, this is the American pattern for sure, in which state power does regulate capital economic power, but it does so in a way that is itself subordinated to economic power. This is what I would call the classic configuration of the capitalist state. Um, the, the social democratic configuration is a very difficult one to sustain, uh, although it, it, does, it has been sustained in partial ways in some places, even in the neoliberal era. Uh, the more common configuration in capitalist society is that it's a form of capitalist empowerment uh, with the configuration looking like this. Associational democracy is a second type of social democratic form. This is represented by various kinds of tripartite peak bargaining, or what sometimes was called neo-corporatism, where associations of social power, economic power, and state power co-determine the regulation of various kinds of economic activity, in which, ideally, social power is the dominant force. Now, in fact, in many corporatist context, the social power becomes a secondary force. Uh, now we have three pathways that I associate with the term social economy, three configurations. The first I call social capitalism. I gave an example briefly already, solidarity financing. The solidarity financing in Quebec is an example of social capitalism. Unions are a form of social power. Unions allocate part of their pensions in Quebec to the direct investment uh, in, as equity investors in small and medium firms, which gives them some control over the use of that economic power. Uh, the core social economy is the direct production of goods and services uh, through voluntary association. Wikipedia is an example. Wikipedia is an almost pure example of um, pure social economy. The production of this extraordinary resource made available to everybody freely in the world is done through voluntary cooperation and association. Uh, but there are many other examples of, uh, besides Wikipedia. And the third social economy type is what I would call the cooperative market economy. Cooperative market economy is um, an economy of worker-owned firms which has sufficient density so that there's cooperation among the cooperators. Uh, Mondragon in Spain is a an example of this. Mondragon is a conglomeration of 270 worker-owned cooperatives which form a cooperative of cooperatives and in which their joint cooperation with each other um, is what, me what creates this relationship uh, through their ability to engage in collective planning and uh, cross-subsidization and mutual support in all sorts of ways. If you put all of these, oh, and one more, what I call, would call participatory socialism. So this is a second socialist pathway uh, configuration. The first one was statist socialism. This is participatory socialism. 
Uh, the participatory budget is an example. The participatory budget involves the direct involvement of citizens in the production of uh, public infrastructure and their indirect involvement through their control over uh, the municipal government. If you put all those together, you then get these, this nice multicolored diagram, um, which also encompasses a pretty broad spectrum of uh, strategies on the left, partial visions. Uh, you have the set of socialist pathways, which involve social power, state power, and economic activity. You have the social economy pathways, some of which are associated historically with certain strands of anarchism, in which uh, the state is pretty much on the sidelines. And you have the social democratic pathways, which try to link together social power, state power, and economic power. Now, my view is that all of these pathways are legitimate. They should not be viewed in competition with each other. Now, in particular contexts, they may be. In particular contexts, choices may have to be made between where you're going to put your energy, uh, what, what kind of institutions you're going to devote struggles around, and so on. But in principle, these are complementary, and they can reinforce each other, creating forms of participatory socialism through participatory budgets can make it easier to form cooperatives. Uh, cooperatives can be enhanced by creating public infrastructure in support of co cooperation. So these may be complementary and not um, always conflictual. That's the conceptual map that I use to, then to locate specific empirical cases of real utopias and to try to theorize the conditions under which certain kinds of institution creation um, become possible or difficult. But it still leaves open the question of how do you accomplish it? What's the strategies for transformation? That's a whole nother big topic. I, I'll only be able to give you the two minute version of it so that we have uh, time for discussion. Um, the two minute version revolves around distinguishing three strategic logics of transformation. So these are all to be thought of as logics of the way you go about building institutions. The core of creating an alternative to capitalism is creating alternative institutions. The ruptural strategy says you just can't do it until you destroy capitalism. Smash first, build second. The only way to build an alternative is to destroy the dominant centers of power. If you try to build alternatives without doing that, it will inevitably fail. That's the strong ruptural vision. And the kind of um, synoptic statement is smash first, build second. I mean, of course, that's crude, but I think it captures the idea of rupture. That's, of course, associated with the revolutionary socialist tradition. Interstitial transformation, interstitial transformation, argues uh, that we should build new institutions in the cracks and contradictions and gaps and spaces of the existing system. Build now, don't wait. Uh, if the ruptural view of the state is smash the state, the interstitial view is ignore the state. Work around it, work around the centers of power, build your Wikipedia now, build your worker co-ops now, uh, get on with the business of building alternatives inside of the spaces that are possible in the existing society, in the existing world. And that's associated again with certain strands in the, in the anarchist tradition of anti-capitalist uh, po politics. And finally, there's what I would call symbiotic strategies of transformation. These involve using existing s institutions, dominant institutions, use those institutions to solve problems, but in a specific way, to solve problems in a way that transforms those institutions and expands social power. Uh, that's associated with the left of social democracy. Uh, if you want to specify these traditions with res these strategies with respect to the state. Uh, the first is smash the state, the second is ignore the state, and the third is use the state. Now any little synoptic statement like that, of course, is reductionist. It's much more complicated. Each of these strategies has many dimensions and aspects. And in real world contexts, people don't say, which of these should I pick? They mix and match and take pieces of one strategy and combine it with others. This is part of developing, if you will, a conceptual menu of strategic logics. And then the task that we face, either as political activists or as 
academics or scholars trying to figure out conditions of possibility of transformation, is to think through the problem of how and under what context different strategies have the greatest force, the greatest plausibility. Um, out of this analysis comes five basic conclusions. Now, I haven't set up all of these conclusions in this rapid um, tour through the core of my argument. But let me just run down them, because they, I think, are important. And, um, and they might tempt you to want to read the book, not because I want to sell books, but because <laughs> I think that the, uh, the grounding for these conclusions are worth thinking through, and the grounding you can find in the larger text for which this is the conclusion. So here are five conclusions from my e exploration of these problems. First, that the problem of transcending capitalism is the problem of democratization. Democracy is the key. That's the way we should think about going beyond capitalism, is democratizing the society. Profound democratization is the transformation of capitalism. Secondly, the process of transformation must be thought of in terms of institutional pluralism and heterogeneity. There is not one institutional form, but multiple institutional forms, um, multiple configurations of social empowerment in order to create the institutions of alternative. A third conclusion, there are no guarantees. Socialism is a terrain for working for social and political justice, not a guarantee for realizing those ideals. Now, this is a difficult conclusion, and it would take a lot for me to explain exactly what I mean by it. There is a temptation in discussions of socialism to define the ideals we want to accomplish in the very definition of socialism. So socialism is a society that realizes social justice that realizes human flourishing, that realizes solidarity. I prefer to define socialism in terms of a set of institutional principles and then ask the question, to what extent will this realize those values? I don't want to package the values into the very definition of socialism. Rather, I want to define the concept structurally, institutionally, and then ask the question, to what extent if we could achieve that, will that make it easier to achieve these values? And there, I think there is no guarantee. I don't think a world of human flourishing, of equality, of um, equal access of all people to the conditions to live a flourishing life is guaranteed by democratization. But what I do believe is that um, the more democratic a society is, the easier it is to struggle for those values. The essential idea, then, is that different institutions of power configurations make possible or impede the struggle over certain kinds of values, but it doesn't guarantee the success of those struggles. And that ultimately depends upon agency, on the human capacity to actually get the job done. Uh, the institutions impede or facilitate that, and why I am a socialist and an anti-capitalist is because of a belief that socialist institutions defined in this way facilitate that kind of struggle. Uh, fourth point, strategic indeterminacy. There is no one way. This is about the ruptural, interstitial, and symbiotic strategies. I think um, context determines which of these strategies and in what ways they need to be packaged for particular struggles. And there's no abstract general formula that answers that question. And finally, the fifth conclusion, the opacity of the future limits of possibility. We cannot know in advance how far we can go in this trajectory of social empowerment. It may turn out to be impossible, right? I don't have a thesis of the sort that Marx had, which speaks of the historical necessity of socialism, necessity in the sense that the contradictions of capitalism will increasingly pose socialism as the alternative that people will embrace. I have no prediction of that sort. I don't have a prediction of the opposite sort either. Uh, I don't know what the limits of possibility are. So the best I can do is to try to chart what kinds of institutional transformations give us the best prospects of realizing these values. 
and develop a vocabulary for forms of struggle that at least give us some handle on how we go about engaging in th those struggles. And then it's really a process of historical experimentation and contestation that uh, will decide the question of whether or not we can realize these values in practice. Thank you very much. Thank you.